this is the second last installment of the series for the month of February. If you're just joining us, rather than preach about love, I decided to preach about Stranger Things because nothing is as strange as love. Stranger Things simply talks about the fact that our lives are filled with things we cannot explain. Things that we cannot even begin to fathom. Sometimes when you pray, you don't know what you're praying about, you don't know what you're praying for. So each message has touched on an interesting Bible text with life lessons that we can take with us every day. I, I, I do admit that the first two were, were rather challenging for some because it was very pointed and very challenging. And uh, I must say, it doesn't get any better today. Today's message is entitled, When Petty Things Matter. When Petty Things Matter. Does anybody know what the word petty means? Not pretty, petty. Right, what's the, what's the Bahasa word for petty? What's that? Kachil? It, 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 yeah, kachil, but there's a more negative. Petty means you make a big deal out of small things. What's the, what's the word? Not, not Nambok. Nambok is not the word. What is it? That word. Spell, spell something. That one. That one. Let's not be petty about the pronunciation. That's right. When petty things matter, let it go. When petty things matter, that's what the message is today. Let me share a few interesting facts with you about human beings. Human beings are passionate when they have a reason to be. Human beings will fight for things that matter to them. One of the things that human beings have been known to fight for is their country. When a soldier goes to war, he, he, he has nothing against the other soldier. It's just that he needs to defend his country. And so those who are patriotic and brave would join the army to become soldiers to fight for the honor, integrity, safety, and presence of the nations they come from. Do you have any soldiers in here? Anybody a soldier? Not of Christ, but of the country. <laughs> Anybody a soldier here? Any soldiers? Anybody took national service of any kind? Anybody know what a soldier is? No soldiers in here. Okay. Soldiers of Christ. And, and then you got, you got this one. Uh, people fight for religion. In fact, most of the major wars uh, in the past history of humanity, most of the major whole wars fought were motivated by religion. Were motivated by religion. Okay? That's a reality. Even today, even in capitalistic, uh, a materialistic society, religion still plays a major role in the wars or the conflicts that exist in the world today. Another thing that human beings love to fight for, especially our, 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 our millennials and Gen Z, is they like to fight for the weak. Those who cannot represent themselves is uh, one of the common things in Europe right now is this uh, issue of refugees coming from Africa and other parts of uh, the Middle East moving for political asylum reasons or economic reasons. Some people reject them, but some of them say, you're welcome and we're willing to fight for you. In fact, some lawyers and counselors are giving over their services free of charge to help these people uh, to be treated like human beings. Then you got this one where people are willing to fight for their families. Generally speaking, mothers and fathers will scratch and scrape and save and labor to make sure that their kids and their friends, their spouses, their family members are taken care of. Because if you're not fighting for family, what are you fighting for? And then you got fighting for love. And by the way, that's an actual Korean drama called Fighting for Love. Don't you dare take out your phone and start trying to Google it right now. Do it later. Don't be petty, all right? Uh, love is something worth fighting for, okay? If you don't believe that, it means you've never been in love, okay? Love is worth fighting for as long as it's the right person worth fighting for. Amen, somebody. Amen. Fighting for wealth. Besides religion, besides honor and country, underlying the reasons of the wealthy and the rich is fighting for wealth. The Gulf War. That was not about religion, that was about oil. Wealth is a reason to fight from yesterday until today. I'm from Africa. We were planted for hundreds of years for our resources. So I understand the concept of fighting for wealth, but the colonialists have left, now we're fighting each other for that wealth. 
Wall Street, financial success, career, all these kind of things. We fight for these things because we believe in what they represent. Let me say this as I get started. In life, there are things worth fighting for, especially when they have spiritual implications. And this statement holds true for those who are believers, for those who have surrendered their existence to the eternal God and to those that love Jesus with all their heart. You understand that every choice that you make, every breath you take, every decision, every waking moment that you live, your fight is spiritual even though it takes place in the physical world. Whether it's about wealth, love, family, uh, country, religion, it is all spiritual in nature once you admit that you are created by the God of heaven. Let's read the text together for this morning. Take your Bible. Take your Bible. I'm going to read from 2 Samuel chapter 23. I'm going to be reading verses number 8 down to verse number 12. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse number 8 down to verse number 12. I am reading from the New King James Version. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb, Bashibeth, the Tachmonite, or Tachmonite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him, second dude, was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, no, that's not the strange part of the text, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with whom David, mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. The Bible says he arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary. And his hand stuck to the sword. Another version says, his hand froze while holding the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. And finally, verse 11 and 12. And after him was Shemar, the son of Agi the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And so the people fled from the Philistines. But he, Shema, stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. And so the Lord brought about a great victory. One of the greatest biblical figures that we all celebrate, in fact, uh, one of the things that we have in common with the Jews is the heritage and legacy of King David. From his youth until his death, David left such a deep mark on religion through song, through conquest, through kingship. In fact, he should have been the first king of Israel and not Saul because every time another king lived, the Bible said, this king was righteous like his father, David. In fact, Jesus is connected with David. He is called son David. the son of David. He is the root and branch of David. Now, understanding the legacy of David, you must know that David was who he was, not just because of himself. David believed in God. Amen. David was a believer in the God of heaven. Right. Through all his flaws and all his mistakes and all his weaknesses, David always knew it's time to go back to God. When the prophet confronted him with his sin, David didn't argue. David didn't appeal to cultural law or Jewish law, but he said, I have sinned. David knew what it was to come before God. And when you read uh, first, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22, 23 up to 25, the Bible keeps repeating, and David became great. And David became great because God had his back. If you want to be great, it has nothing to do with your intelligence, your gifts, your ability to make money. It has everything to do with the goodness of God. Would somebody say amen? amen. But on top of that... David also surrounded himself with the right people. 
David could not fight a whole army by himself. Yes, he could kill a lion. Yes, he could kill a bear. Yes, he could kill a, kill a giant called Goliath. Goliath. But David couldn't do it all by himself. And so being the general that he was, like LeBron James in the Lakers right now, David surrounded himself with the right kind of people. Today, I want to tell you about three of those men. But I want to focus on one of them. The Bible says in verse 8, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. They are called mighty. They are called mighty. Question, where were, where, where were they when David confronted Goliath? As Goliath was screaming and shouting, where were these mighty men? I want to show you something about influence that is found in this text. That David's ability to stand for what he believed, David's ability to rise because he believed in God, affected other people around him. When David was anointed king, it took up to 12 years or so, if I'm correct, to, for him to actually mount the throne. David had to run for his life, but as he was in the cave, the Bible says that soldiers, ordinary men, discouraged men, men with debts and men with vendettas, left the land and joined David in the cave of Agilam. These three men and 30 others were part of that group of men. What is it that made them mighty? The Bible says, speaking of Josheb, the Bible says that he was chief among the captains. That means that he reported directly to David. He was what Joshua was to Moses. And how did he get that reputation? The Bible says he had killed 800 men at one time using a spear. Now, I know that you guys have been watching way too much Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings to be impressed by that number. But do you understand that when you fight with a spear, the only part that is dangerous about a spear is the end part. So you're fighting men with swords and crossbows and all that kind of stuff. But he managed to kill not eight, not 80, but 800. My question is, what was man number 800 thinking to himself? 799 people have been killed. What makes you think you got a chance? That's another story for another day. The Bible says he killed them at one time. Second dude. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. Yeah. The men of Israel had retreated. So one day in a battle, uh, as the Israelites were facing the Philistines, I think the rest of the soldiers saw how menacing the Philistines were, and the Bible says they ran away. But this man, Eliezer, it says that he arose. He attacked the Philistines until his hand got tired. What happened when you read the text? He was holding the sword for so long that his muscle cramped, and he couldn't let go of the sword. And so he just kept, he kept hacking and hacking. And the Bible says in verse number 10, verse 11, that God gave him the victory. Because when you hold on and don't let go, God will bless you. But we're not talking about brother Josheb. We're not talking about Eliezer. We want to talk about this other brother. First statement that I got for you today. Spiritual warfare is a 24-7 endeavor that requires your absolute presence. Uh, he held the sword continuously until the battle was over. Our problem is that sometimes we put, we put the sword down to take our phones. We, we put the sword down to, to pick up a movie ticket. We, we, pick, we put the sword down to pick up other distractions. And while the sword is down, that's when the devil comes. When you stop praying, when you stop worshiping, when you stop going to church, when you stop doing godly things, that's when the devil comes. And so like this brother, make sure that your hand cramps while you're holding on to God. Jacob said, I will never let you go until you bless me. But we're not, we're not talking about him. We're, we're talking about Shema, the son of, uh, is that, is that, is that, is that uh, Agi or Aji? There's a lot of weird names in this text today. The Bible says, and here's the strange part of the text. This is probably the most interesting story or battle I've ever read in the Bible. And that's discounting the fact that David circumcised or cut off. Let's go to the text. Let's go to the text. The Bible says the Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. Does anybody know what lentils are? You know, you know what lentils are? Do, do, do munga beans qualify to be called lentils? Right? They, they, 
It's, a, it's a, some type of a bean, right? You would know. You would know because you, you eat vegetables and stuff, right? You would know. Let, it, it's a, please, please use your imagination right now. I, I need your imagination. Otherwise, this message is not going to make any sense to you. The Philistines are continuously, every day, attacking Israel. From the time of Saul through the time of David and onwards. They are always constantly attacking God's people. And you can attest that your life is full of attacks on a daily basis. And one of the things that nations fought for back then, and I believe to a certain extent today, is land. Is land. I know uh, China and the Philippines are fighting for airspace, if I'm not mistaken, or is it sea? I know that uh, uh, you've got... uh, 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 what was this? The Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip. Okay, between Palestine and Israel, there's always a fight for a piece of land. I understand fighting for the Gaza Strip. What I don't understand is fighting for a small garden of beans. That's what the sermon is about today. He's not fighting for love. He's not fighting for country. He's not fighting for wealth. Pastor Henry, he's fighting for a piece of land, a garden with beans on it. Food is important. The enemy knows small gardens can produce strong men. You do understand that even even though a garden is small, you can eat from it for at least a month or two if you're careful in how you consume. So that little garden has the potential to provide food for you than going to the grocery store or the supermarket and spending money. Here's what the devil knew. If I'm going to destroy the nation of Israel, I must destroy what they consume. Because when you take from a man's mouth, you take his ability to stand. That is why the Bible is called spiritual food. If the devil can stop you from reading the Bible, he doesn't have a problem with you going to church. He has absolutely no problem with you joining midweek and small groups and joining these uh, religious groups on Facebook and following Instagram posts that are religious. What he doesn't want is you actually consuming the word of God. So there's this piece of land, it's a garden of beans, and the devil says to the Philistines, you go and you occupy that piece of land. Now, fighting for a garden of beans strikes me as something petty, personally. It feels petty because I'm pretty sure there's other things to fight for, like your house, your property, or the kingdom, or at least protecting the king. But the Bible tells us that when the Philistines gathered in this garden of beans, that the soldiers, the people of Israel, ran away. Because in their minds, pastor, this is not worth fighting for. This is way, it's way too small a thing or an issue to deal with. Can't we focus on the bigger things? Why get stuck in these little things? See, see, married people understand what I'm talking about. No, no, let me be specific. Husbands understand what I'm talking about. You are taught by society to pick your battles. Because if you fight for the toilet seat, you're not going to be allowed to go watch soccer on Sunday afternoon. So you're taught to pick your battles. Don't focus on the small things. Don't fight about tissue paper. Don't fight about eating each other's food in the fridge. And most definitely, don't fight about passwords to phones. I am not testifying, I am preaching. And so the people fled from the Philistines. And the Bible says, but this brother Shema, he stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. Samson killed the Philistines for love. I'm sorry, for lust. Samson killed men because of a woman. This brother killed Philistines for a garden of beans. He will forever go down in history as the man who defended a garden of beans. Why is this significant? Uh, I was reading a book called, um, I'm trying to remember the full title, Uh, Something about the the victories of spiritual warfare, something like that, is written by a preacher, a pastor called Tony Evans. And this is what he says about spiritual warfare. You are not fighting for victory. Please pay attention. You are not fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory. This battle has already been won. What would possess this man to fight for a garden of beans? What would possess the other people 
to run away. It's simple. The other people felt the Philistines were more powerful than them and it was not worth the hassle of fighting them for a small piece of land. But for Shema, every inch of ground mattered. Because God had promised through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, all the prophets, Saul and King David, that the promised land of Canaan belonged to God's people. Therefore, not an inch, foot, centimeter or meter of land should be occupied by the enemy. Some people think that it's okay. You don't have to fight for everything. Give up some things and gain some things. We negotiate with the devil. We read the book that says how to win 50-50 in a negotiation. We give him, he gives us. But unfortunately, I want you to know that when you give the devil, he keeps taking and taking. The devil is like a dog. When you give a dog a bone, it wants the whole skeleton. So if you give away a garden of beans, he's going to want a field of barley, he's going to want a vineyard of grapes, and eventually he's going to want your children, your marriages, your land, your soul. So when you give up just a garden, you are allowing him a foot to take over everything. 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 So be careful about allowing, allowing yourself to give up more than you should. The Bible says that he stood in the middle of the field. I thought that was a coincidence, so I looked at every translation. Where exactly did he station himself? Every version says he stood in the middle. He stood in the middle. He didn't stand at the edge because it's hard to defend a piece of land when you're standing at the edge. Because if you stand at the edge, what are you doing? You're exposing part of the land. If you're with me so far, let me hear you say yes. yes. Okay, fantastic. So he's fighting for a small garden of beans. That's what he's fighting for. Now, the enemy will attack you one garden at a time. One garden at a time. Your kids, your health, your finances, your job, your friendships. He'll attack one garden at a time. And with each garden that you give over, it becomes a field. And each field added together becomes a huge corporate sized farm. And the more you give over, before you realize it, you will be outside with nothing, being nothing, thinking of nothing, and seeing yourself as nothing. So this brother said, I don't care what people say, I'm going to fight for this piece of land. The enemy knows what you're capable of. So he attacks you and it while it is small. Everybody begins with a garden. In fact, if you think about it, man lost his freedom in a garden. I'm pretty sure during the process of applying logic and reason, because that's what we love, logic and reason, Eve said to herself, it's only a fruit. There are thousands of other trees. What's wrong with eating just one? What's wrong with eating just one? I used to say that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was durian because I hated it, but now I eat durian, so now I don't know what fruit it was. <laughs> I'll figure it out. The devil knows what you're capable of, so he doesn't come when you've succeeded. He doesn't come when you're a spiritual giant. He comes at the beginning. He comes at the beginning. Today, I'm going to introduce two souls with Pastor Henry who are going to be baptized next Sabbath. These are the small gardens the devil is looking out for. He knows that if he can steal their joy, if he can steal their love, he has succeeded. And guess who the devil uses to discourage new souls? He doesn't use Netflix. He doesn't use the world. He uses church people. Because church people, we don't eat meat, but we eat each other. Benjamin Franklin said, watch the little things. A small leak will sink a great ship. 
Some of the greatest inventions of humanity were not destroyed by bombs or not destroyed by neglect uh, when it came to large responsibility. It took something small. A lot of air crashes, when they do the investigation, is because of BART. You know what a BART is? Just the thing came off and the, and the plane crashed. A, a billion dollar plane coming down because of something small. Big ships, big reputations, big businesses, big people fall because of small things. Nations like Rome and Greece and, and Russia fell because of something small. Never underestimate a small thing. You need to be petty when it comes to spirituality. War is made up of big and little battles. Sometimes we forget that every battle counts. Every battle counts. There's the war that is made up of little battles. Sometimes you fight on a big field. Think about the world today. Do you know that in our generation, there are more wars taking place than ever before in history? Somebody's like, wait, but it's not World War III. Yeah, no, that's not how wars fought today. Countries are fighting against each other and you don't know it. Uh, Snowden, what's the, what's the brother's name? Mr. Wikipedia, what's his name? Uh, Edward, Snowden. Edward Snowden is a case in point that the world is fighting. Every country has spies. They're spying on each other. They're killing each other in the background. We're busy scrolling. Ooh, Kim Kardashian. But wars are being fought around us. American politics affected by social media. War is taking place every single day because humanity understands that war is fought in big battles and little battles. Your spirituality is the same. Never underestimate it. The war is won one battle at a time. Sometimes we overwhelm ourselves as Christians. You come into the faith and you see somebody else, they're standing up front, they're talking without notes, they're preaching and just memorizing scripture, they're singing beautiful songs, and you're like, oh my Lord, when will I ever be able to do that? It's easy. One song at a time. One sermon at a time. One Bible study at a time. One soul at a time. And one day, you will look back and realize how much success that you've had. The edge is never the best place to stand for anything. Don't ever stand on the edge. Because when you stand on the edge, you will fall over. In the words of Brother Rand DMC, don't push us because we're close to the edge. Think about this. I used to love kung fu movies when I was a kid. Every Friday night. Yeah, I wasn't a, an Adventist when I was a kid. So every Friday night was kung fu night. Ip Man, right? Haven't seen it. Haven't seen it. And, and, and when you watch the movies, every kung fu movie, the, the, the hero is always in the middle, and you got all these idiots standing around him thinking they're going to get him. And you see Bruce Lee just raise his hands like, oh, it's happening now. But if he stood against the wall and is like, come, come to me, I got you, they'll beat him. So he understood if I stand in the middle, I can look at everything. Live your life in the middle, never on the edge. It's easier to focus. I want to tell you a story about how dedicated these three men were to David. Because I want to show you three motivations when it comes to winning the spiritual battles in life. These three brothers, including Shema, they were dedicated to preserving their country, to preserving their relationship with God, but also it was the relationships they had amongst each other. Because when you have people to fight with, you win bigger battles. This is how much they love David. It says probably months or so or years before David became king when he's still on the run. One day David is in the cave. All right? He's in the cave. The Philistines have sta stationed soldiers in, in, in the land close to it and they've surrounded his hometown because they were mocking David. The Bible says that David is in the cave and he's thinking to himself and he speaks out loud. Oh, how much I miss the waters in the wells outside Bethlehem. These three men heard their commander-in-chief say these words. David didn't command them. He just expressed, I miss drinking water from the wells of my city. Being loyal, the Bible says, so these three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines. They drew water from the well and came back to give David so that he could drink it. What did David do with the water? He poured it on the ground and dedicated it to the Lord. That's how dedicated these men were, that David wanted water to drink. They were willing to risk their lives for water. Imagine what they were willing to do for God. What is it you're fighting for today? What motivates you? What, what gets you up in the morning? What brings you to church? 
What is it that drives you to be who you are and do what you do? In the order of things, it should be God, right. the people you fight with, and for everybody else. Because if you fight for God, God will connect you with the right people. And if you're connected with the right people, you will affect change in society in a way that people can never ever do. If one man can fight 800 people with a spear, imagine what two can do. Imagine what four can do. Imagine what five or ten or a hundred can do. Imagine what all of us can do. And the Bible says, and the Lord brought a great victory. Never forget the main catalyst in the victories in your life. It is God. Everything you have is because of God. Every gift is because of God. My brothers and sisters, you're saying, awesome, that's because of God. Everything you have is because of the Lord. When you look at your babies, as smart as they might be or cute as you think they are, that's because of God. When you look at your job, your car, your house, everything that you have, that's because of God. Because when you fight for him, he fights for you. When you fight for him, he fights for you. When you fight for him, he will fight anyone for you. God is in the business of turning little achievements into great victories. So don't discount what you do. These three men were not the king. These three men may not have even been the advisors for David. We only know about them because of the small things they did. Shema is known for defending a garden. But when we think about ourselves, we think we're not doing enough. We, we judge ourselves by the little things. We, we discount ourselves. But I want you to understand that every single day, in the, in the words of James Clear, who wrote the book Atomic Habits, little things become big things, and big things become great things, and great things become impossible things. So wherever you are, start with the garden. And then go to the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and strange things will begin to happen. These men did not start fighting that day. They had been fighting way before that. You got to start somewhere. I'm done. Final statement. For the believer, every battle is spiritual in one way or another. Here's the prayer. Lord, help me fight for every inch of ground. Let us pray. And now, dear Father, with my hand raised, I pray. Please be above us to watch over us. Please be beneath us to lift us up when we fall. Please walk ahead of us to guide us in the way. Please walk behind us that we would never go astray. Please walk by our side as a friend. Please surround us to protect us in our gardens until the end. But above all things, be in the garden of our heart so that we can have such a lasting experiential relationship with Jesus that the enemy will never take the land away again. If this is your prayer, let me hear you say amen and amen. God bless you.